this lecture is an introduction to Massive MIMO. And last, last time when we have another lecture during the first PhD school, we discussed more or less some fundamentals of um, wireless communication in general and on MIMO. And we spent less time because we uh, finished our time on introduction of Massive MIMO. Uh, since these uh, uh, 10 hours that you will uh, do today and tomorrow uh, are some hours on fundamentals of wireless communications in general, and you will have also with Professor Interdonato the introdu introduction to cell 3 Massive MIMO, uh, we decided to uh, put also this uh, additional lecture on Massive MIMO in order to have more time to discuss uh, something that we mm, touched last time very uh, very briefly, because we had not time, uh, in order to uh, to see what is Massive MIMO. Because when I ask to some people what is Massive MIMO, Massive MIMO is MIMO with a lot of antennas. Yes, that's true, but this is not the only thing that we can... That This is not the only thing, because Massive MIMO is, of course, from the point of view of the antennas, okay, we put more antennas. But with Massive MIMO, we have a lot of additional uh, challenges and requirements and a lot of research that we can do. So it's not so simple to say, OK, Massive MIMO is MIMO with a lot of antenna. So and during this lecture, I want to stress some uh, aspects on, on Massive MIMO in order to give you some ways how we can uh, improve this technology and, in fact, during this project, Meta Wireless, we are improving the technology that is already um, that is existing already. That is Massive MIMO and uh, some uh, uh, variations uh, in order to use some environments that can be uh, that can be more or less controlled by RIS by reconfigurable intelligence surfaces. But uh, the main idea is to try to uh, have the benefit of machine MIMO with the different kind of technologies. So um, we, feel we will start, so I will report here on the slides the outline of this presentation. In particular, I have the definition of massive MIMO, the aspects of channel hardening and favorable propagation that are two characteristics that we have when we have infinite number of antennas or, or a lot of antennas. Uh, the concept of pilot contamination, and also I will discuss with you some uh, ways to reduce the pilot contamination. Um, the uh, spectral efficiency bounds that we can obtain for Massive MIMO um, using the property of channel hardening. Uh, and we, uh, I will discuss briefly some precoding and combining design, stressing the uh, uppering and downing duality. Uh, additionally, we will, I will give you some uh, details regarding the energy efficiency aspects of Massive MIMO. Uh, you will discuss also energy efficiency in uh, uh, different kind of environments with the Professor Zappone tomorrow. Um, but here I want simply to stress what, what are the aspects in terms of uh, uh, energy efficiency of Massive MIMO and what are the challenges at which we have to uh, take, uh, take care. Um, additionally, uh, at the end, I will do a summary of this technology and some kind of evolution of Massive MIMO technology that we can think to. Uh, okay, so uh, given this introduction regarding my talk, um, we can see why Massive MIMO. So uh, Massive MIMO is, was introduced and was introduced in literature in particular in 2010 by Thomas Marzetta um, that introduced a very... Uh, good paper uh, that gives also a, um, a perspective on what we can do with all these antennas, with too much antennas. So the main idea is that uh, cellular network today uh, has to take care not, not only the um, voice call, but in particular the data transmission, that is the, the, the um, part of the traffic, that the internet traffic that, that dominates nowadays. We have video on demand, streaming, um, video calls, and so on. With the COVID, we have an explosion of this kind of requests. Um, so we have to give to the users a high area throughput and high uh, efficiency of the spectrum that we are we can use, that we, we buy and we can use a, a portion of the spectrum. And we want to find the way how to have the maximum 
uh, area throughput, the maximum efficiency in terms of how much data we can transmit on this environment, on this spectrum. Uh, so we want to try to increase the uh, area throughput, that is this uh, quantity, that is measured in bit per second per kilometer square. Uh, and uh, the area throughput is a highly relevant performance metric of this uh, of the contemporary wireless networks because we can see how much data we can transmit over some coverage areas. Uh, so it is met measured, as I say, in bit per second per kilometer square and can be modeled using the uh, following high level formula. So we have the area throughput bit per second per kilometer square is equal to bandwidth measured in hertz, of course. D is the density of base station per cell. So is the cells per kilometer square, the, the density of cells per kilometer square, and the spectral efficiency that is measured in bit per second per hertz per cell. So this is the spectral efficiency per cell. Um, so um, this quantity, um, these quantities can be, uh, of course, in order to increase this, um, this uh, the area throughput, we, we have to uh, increase all these parameters. For example, if you want to obtain a, an increase in area throughput in, in terms of, uh, of 1000x, we can, in principle, increase 10, 10 times the bandwidth. So, for example, the, uh, using millimeter waves, um, increasing 10 times the average cell density, for example, using uh, the uh, more base station in an area, um, and increasing 10, 10 times the spectral efficiency. So we can obtain an improving in 1000 or 1000 X, increasing 10 times bandwidth, 10 times density, and 10 times spectral efficiency. So this is one of the uh, uh, main aspects for 5G, why we, um, we introduce the overdensification of cells millimeter waves and massive MIMO in order to increase the area throughput, increasing separately this characteristic. Of course, since we have a multiplicative, the, uh, multiplicative uh, relationship here, we can improve the area throughput uh, accordingly. So uh, allocate more bandwidth, densify the network by employing more base station. Someone raise hand maybe? because um, I can see when I am, okay. So, sorry, yeah. um, uh, when we have questions, uh, is it okay if we raise hand or? Uh... Maybe it's better that you speak because uh, because mm -hmm. if you raise hand, I only uh, hear a little, a, a little noise. So it's better that you speak directly. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so reg regarding the area throughput, uh, I was gonna ask if there was any uh, met metric that uh, also incorporates the energy consumption because uh, possibly incorporating the energy efficiency aspect as well because uh, mm. basically with millimeter waves what we're doing is like we're ha having more small cells deploying more and more access points and uh, like with uh, I think with area throughput alone uh, we're I think we're kind of missing the fact that uh, all these uh, individual access points are consuming more and more energy while increasing the area throughput. And uh, it's, uh, it seems uh, too good to be true in that sense. Yeah, I agree with you because because the uh, idea of increasing the, um, in, in my opinion, uh, in order to take into account also the energy efficiency, we can, for example, consider the area throughput over the power consumption that we that we are doing. For example, if we are employing uh, um, ten base stations instead of five base stations, of course, we are doubling the uh, power consumption of this new base station that we have. So, of course, uh, increasing, including the energy efficiency, can be good. Uh, but as far as I know, the area throughput is a parameter and the energy efficiency is another parameter. So uh, I don't know if there are some parameters that um, relate the area throughput and the power consumption. But I guess that it should be a parameter that can be considered. But for example, if you if you know the paper for uh, 5G, what will 5G be, uh, they, uh, in order to start and to say what are the main three technologies that we that we have that are millimeter waves, over densification, and uh, uh, and massive MIMO, 
um, the concept of energy efficiency was uh, introduced and they spent some time in order to, to clarify some aspect of energy efficiency. But in terms of area throughput, we have not a formula that take area throughput over the energy efficiency. But in my opinion, it should be, it should be considered. So, for example, uh, the energy efficiency is defined in general as the sum rate that we can have, so the throughput that we have in a, in a region, over the energy consumption. But the area throughput is a parameter that takes care about a higher system. So, I don't know if there are some uh, other parameter, other uh, um, performance measures that take into account area throughput over power consumption. Uh, so I guess that it should be it should be considered. Of course, it, it is a very important a very important parameter. The energy efficiency is one of the and also you will talk with uh, Professor Zappone regarding the energy efficiency and how to uh, allocate power and resources in order to increase the energy efficiency of the network. That of course you are increasing the uh, we are increasing the ratio. So maybe we are reducing a little bit about the sum rate the throughput really, the, the real throughput that we can have, but we are also decreasing the denominator. So at the end of the story, you are increasing the ratio. So, but of course this, this should be considered. Okay, so I, I uh, reply to your questions. You want to add something? Uh, no, no, thank you. Uh, okay. Thank you very much for your oh. answer. Okay, uh, okay, so so uh, again, if you have questions, please speak directly because I cannot see the uh, hand raised in uh, uh, in in Google Meet. Okay, so uh, what Massive MIMO does is to improve the spectral efficiency. So the point one is uh, obtained with millimeter waves. So uh, increasing the frequency, the carrier frequency at which, at which we are working, we increase the we can increase the bandwidth that we allocate for each system. Uh, densify the network by deploying more base station is the offloading or it's the not offloading the over densification of base station but of course we have to pay attention on this point because in, uh, improve increasing the number of base station that we are uh, deploying on um, in an area, we are increasing the power consumption. We are increasing also the uh, fiber optic cables that we need in order to con connect the base station to the core network. So we have to pay attention to these aspects. But regarding Massive MIMO, we are improving the spectral efficiency per cell using this technology that, of course, uh, use a lot of antennas at the base station. Uh, and of, of course, also in this case, we have to pay attention on energy efficiency. So we have to pay attention in order to uh, to see how we can consume less power in order to obtain good performance. And we also have a brief discussion about, uh, about this at the end of, of my presentation. So um, we said last time, what is spectral efficiency? Uh, I started with the nyquist shannon sample theorem. Uh, saying that this theorem implies that the band-limited communication system that is sent over a channel with a bandwidth B hertz is uh, completely determined by two B real valued equal space at the samples per second. Uh, if we think to, uh, that each sample can be uh, represented by a real part and imaginary part, we can see that we can consider complex based representation of the signal. Um, we have B complex valued samples per second. Um, in the, is, uh, this, this is the more natural quantity um, uh, and these samples are the degree of freedom available for designing the communication signal. So this is the definition of spectral efficiency. Uh, the spectral efficiency of an encoding and decoding scheme is the average number of bits that we can send uh, per complex valued sample. Uh, that it can be reliably transmit over the channel under consideration. So, of course, the spectral efficiency is the number of bits that reliably arrive to our destination. So, from this definition, it is clear that the spectral efficiency is a deterministic number that can be measured in bits per complex valid sample. Uh, but it's, it is more, more um, easy, it is easier to represent to, to, to see that B samples per se, we have B samples per second, um, an equivalent uh, uh, measure for spectral efficiency, it is the more used one, is the bit per second per hertz. Um, so, um, so in this slide, I summarize that the massive MIMO is not 
only put a lot of antennas at the base station. In particular, a, highly, a highly spectral efficiency cellular network can be characterized by three main characteristics. So more base station antennas than UE, this is the idea. So we are putting a lot of antennas, but we are, we are not serving, uh, for example, if you have uh, uh, 100 antennas, we are not serving 100 users. Uh, because we need to use the space division access, access SDMA beam forming, to achieve a multiplexity gain by serving multiple users on the same time frequency resources. So we use a lot of antennas in order to steer narrow beams to our users. Uh, in general, massive MIMO, there are also some, paper that were, some papers that were some FDT, but uh, the uh, original version that was introduced by Mazzetta and also that was the uh, main topic of uh, the, the main topic, topic that was studied in literature, um, work with the TDD mode, so time division duplex mode, um, in order to limit the CSI acquisition overhead. Uh, due to the multiple antennas, we have that if we are using, for example, two different frequencies over uh, to transmit in uplink and downlink, we are to we are to estimate the channel on uplink and the channel on downlink. Um, so this is from the point if we have a lot of antennas, this is from the point of view of the how much training, how much sequence, uh, mm, what is the length of the training sequence we have to send. Um, we have a lot of overhead. So we are reducing the time in which we have transmitting, uh, we can transmit uh, um, uh, informational symbol because if we use a lot of time to estimate the channel, we transmit few symbols, then the channel changes. So we have to estimate the channel again. So because of that, we have to try to, to have the less time to, uh, we have to spend the less resources as we can in order to estimate the channel because the channel, as we said also last time, changes very fastly. So the Massive MIMO technology embraces these uh, three designing guidelines, making it an efficient way to achieve high spectral efficiency in current, because 5G uh, use, for example, six, 64 base station, 64 antennas base station to transmit data. Um, so uh, Massive MIMO is use these guidelines together in order to improve the spectral efficiency on our system. So improve one part of the area throughput formula that we said before. So um, a massive MIMO network is roughly a multi-carrier cellular network with M cells that cooperate, that operate, sorry, not cooperate because the, co the, the concept of cooperation will be, uh, will be discussed later, uh, that operate according to synchronous TDD protocol. Um, the characteristic as this, the each base station for example, base station M is equipped with NM antennas um, to achieve channel hardening. Uh, base station M communicate with KM single antenna users simultaneously on each time frequency symbol with antenna UE ratio that is bigger than one. So we have to, to be more antennas than, base, than users served on the same carrier, uh, on the same time frequency resources. And each base station operate individually and process it, its signal using linear receive combining and linear transmit precoding. So these three characteristics are the characteristic of the original version of Massive MIMO. Um, so uh, the first point is maintained more or less in all the in all the paper that you can read about Massive MIMO. Uh, the first point, the, the fact that the Massive MIMO work with DDD also is the uh, largest assumption that is made when in um, uh, that is made in the current literature, but we, you can find also some massive MIMO with FDD, so with uh, division in free. So I use a portion of spectrum to transmit on uplink, a portion of spectrum to transmit on downlink, so I have to estimate both the channels, so I have to do some different um, processings. Uh, also, um, um, this this is the point more or less is you can find this point more or less in all the uh, in all the uh, papers but the point that can be um, can be significantly modified is that for example you can assume also multiple antenna users with multiple antennas this is of course not only uh, consider multiple antenna users and okay you put more antenna the users and you are fine 
if you put more antenna at the users, you have to take care about the informing and the combining that you use at the users. So your processing is considerably changed. Um, also, uh, another, another consideration that um, is present in the original and in the largest part of the Massive Memo paper is the fact that each base station operates individually. So uh, the concept of uh, base station cooperation is quite old in, uh, in, uh, in literature, uh, but with the cooperation between base station, we can, we can have hand higher and higher spectral efficiency, so an higher and higher um, performance. So some papers in literature, you can find some pa paper in literature that consider base station cooperation also in massive mind. Um, so this is to say that on this slide, I summarize what are the, the characteristics of the original version of Massive MIMO. I'm not doing a, a, a review of all, the, um, of all the literature about this topic, because as you can imagine, if you put, if you write Massive MIMO on Google Scholar, you will find thousands of papers. Uh, each of these papers has, has a different assumption or a different modification regarding these three main points. Uh, but the main idea is that using these three points, we can uh, also using these three points, we can ask, we can have a higher performance improvement with respect to a system with, uh, for example, one of two antennas at the base station. So um, another uh, definition that we you have to pay attention to is the definition of coherence block. Uh, also, last time we discussed what is the coherence time, the coherence bandwidth, and we say that uh, we have to operate in a coherence block. So uh, when you are transmitting some signal, we have to operate in a kind of rectangular in which we can assume the channel that is constant in time and in frequency. This is what OFDM does. So this is OFDM divide a frequency selective channel in a lot of slices and work on each slices. So in general, the um, large majority of, of literature in Massive Mimo that you can find work in a coherence block. So work on a, a, a block OFDM, on an OFDM subcarrier, uh, on which we can assume that the channel is considered constant. So this is why OFDM was introduced and mass, the large majority of papers of Massive Mimo work in this direction. So, uh, and it, it is most, most important to consider and to work in the coherence block. So a coherence block consists of a number of subcarriers and time samples, so it's a rectangular, in, if, we, if we assume a, um, a x, y axis with time and frequency, this, this coherence block can be represented by a rectangular, maybe I have a plot here. So if we assume time and frequency, one coherence block is this rectangular in this graph. Uh, so if the coherence bandwidth is BC and the coherence time is tau C, each coherence block contains tau C samples that can be obtained by their, uh, the product between coherence bandwidth and coherence time. So these are complex value samples that we can use. So if we, if we transmit tau C complex value sample consequently, we are saying that we work in this coherence block. So we can assume that the channel is constant. So uh, take that you have this part, since you are in this, uh, this rectangular, since you are a TDD approach, we can use part of this rectangular, part, part of this block to transmit uplink data symbols and part to transmit downlink data symbols. So um, of course, as I said before, we need at least to estimate the channel and the number of complex value samples that we use to estimate the channel is in general named by tau p. So we first estimate the channel on uplink, then transmit data on uplink, and then transmit data on downlink. So why the um, estimation is made on down and uplink, maybe last time I uh, spent some time to, on this topic. Uh, in particular, we transmit, we, um, we estimate the channel on uplink for a very simple reason. So uh, assume that you have a lot of users. Uh, these users need to, transmit, to estimate the channel. So the base station needs to estimate this channel, and then the channel that the base station estimate on the uplink is used also to transmit data on the downlink, for example, with kind of beamforming, linear beamforming that we can think. So um, if the users transmit data, the base station receives data over 
the N antennas that, that the base station has. So it has observation and has N different observation of the same channel. So can process in a more efficient way and, uh, and uh, observations in order to estimate the channel, for example, with NMMC, uh, NMMC channel estimation that we will discuss now. If we assume the downlink channel estimation, so the base station transmit and the user receive, and also you can find some paper that do this assumption. Uh, so if you if you uh, assume that the base station transmit and the user receive, uh, you have that the base station transmit with n antennas, but each user has an observation over only one or more antennas. But assume that we are in a single antenna, so we have an observation on only on one antenna. So at this point, we need more data, more samples in order to estimate the channel over all the, all the antennas at the base station that we, ha that we have. So uh, the main idea is that to transmit this data on uplink, because on uplink, we can have uh, simultaneously more observation of the same channel. So we can have more data to estimate the channel. Um, so, the main the main topic is that here we work in a coherence block and all this the signal model that i report here is assumed in order to work in one of these re rectangular that we have here so um here i start with some system models some formulas that i um, will go um to discuss these formulas in deep if you have some questions of course speak and ask so um, we assume that the UEs are equipped with one, with only one antennas. As I said before, you can find some uh, some uh, variations in literature. Uh, while the amped base station is equipped with NM antennas. So uh, the set of uh, uh, UEs is denoted by uh, callif calligraphic K, and uh, ca uh, uh, capital K is its cardinality. So we have a multicellular a multi-cell environment with K antennas, with K users, sorry, and with M base stations. Uh, the set of base station is denoted by calligraphic M and its cardinality is capital M. Uh, we also denote by KM the set of users served by the M base station. This set can be uh, selected in a different way. Uh, but in general, the, the users assigned to the, to the base station that they hear with the highest power. So um, they measure, can measure, for example, the power that they receive. Um, and we can see, okay, this is my closest base station. This is the base station that will serve me, that I have to expect the data from this base station. Um, of course, this association is made on a coherence block and is not fixed because the user can move. Uh, and also the fading channel can, uh, can considerably change the received power. And at the end of the story, we can have higher, uh, we can have that, for example, the same user in the same location can hear in, with a higher power, for example, another base station in a different coherence block. So this KM is, of course, a dynamic set that can change over the uh, in different coherence blocks. Uh, and we assume that capital KM is the cardinality of this set. So it's the number of users served by the base station M. Of, of course, given that the, the fact that each user selects the best base station, this KM can be different for different base station because of course the user distribution is random and can change over the coherence blocks. So uh, we denote by, K, by GKM, a channel vector the, with uh, an M, with an M uh, observation, with an M uh, entries. Uh, that is the channel between the Kate user and the M to base station. So with GKM, we are assuming the uplink channel. Why we use uplink channel? Because this is the channel that we can directly estimate by uplink training, by uplink, uh, uplink channel estimation. So this channel in general can be can be represented by correlated fading uh, by different kind of channels, uh, but here I report the um, more used uh, and the original model that was in that was used for uh, for uh, uh, for the the channel that is uh, the square root of the path loss that is coefficient that takes into account path loss and large scale fading. 
um, shadow fading and large scale fading coefficient. Um, and HKM takes into account the uh, fast fading part that can be represented by Rayleigh fading, so the, with IID complex normal 0, 1 entries. Or, for example, um, HKM can follow, for example, a correlated uh, model in which we have that the channel HKM has a correlation matrix that is not identical that, for example, assume a kind of correlation between different antennas. And I will show also the performance uh, in the case in which we have H, we have a correlated channel. So we have a kind of correlation between different antennas. In the Rayleigh channel, we are in the worst case, in which we are assuming that the channel over different antennas is not correlated. So uh, we can consider in general two approaches to massive MIMO networks. The first approach is the non-cooperative base station, that is the original approach introduced by Marzetta that contains the largest part of the papers on massive MIMO. Um, so in this case, we have that each user is served exactly by one base station. So the user selects only the base station with the highest, uh, the highest that it receives with the highest power. So in formula, we can see that user K is served by only one base station, uh, gen generally, this is the base station that it uh, received with the largest large scale fading coefficient. Um, and in particular, we have that if we denote by we not denote by by MK the use the base station that serves the user K, we can find this base station looking to all the parameter beta that are the large scale fading coefficient and pick the parameter beta beta KM the largest parameter that is the parameter that corresponds to the base station B, uh, the base station and K. So in formula, we have the argument of the maximum over the number of the number of base station that we can have of beta K M. So K is fixed, is fixed, and M vary over one to M, and we found the maximum, and take the argument of this maximum as M K. So this is the approach that we will discuss now. Uh, but the approach of cooperative base station is use it then, and you will discuss this with the professor in the Donato in particular, uh, for the self-free massive MIMO. Uh, the uh, concept of cooperative base station, of cooper cooperation between different base stations in wireless systems, is a concept, a very important concept, because we have that, for example, if we have, if you have some users in the cell edge of a system, you can have that these users uh, experiences experience a very low SNR because they are far from the base station that is serving there, uh, that is serving them, and near to the base station that is interfering with them. So the SNR is decrease uh, decrease with respect to other users that are in the cell in the cent in the center of the cells. So uh, how we can improve the performance of these users in the cell edge using uh, transmitting, for example, useful signal by the two base stations that are in the cell at which the, um, this user um, is, uh, so uh, the two cells that are near to this user. So we can use two base stations to transmit signal over one user. In this case, we have that the two base station needs to know what is this user, what is the data that is receiving, so they have to cooperate, they have to communicate some way. So you have to increase to uh, introduce some kind of cooperation. You have to to consider a kind of central processing unit that communicate between the two base stations in order to find what is the signal that we have to transmit. You have to take care about synchronization. You have to take care about a lot of things. Um, so in the case in formula, we have that the cooperation between base station is the case in which we have that each user is served by more than one base station. So, for example, we can see that the base station uh, can be for, for the user K. For, for example, we have a user in the cell edge, and we want to serve this user not by one base station, but, but by two base stations. In this case, the SNR is considerably improved. In fact, we have that if we have user K and we want to serve this user with MK base station, so in my example, one user is served by two base stations, so MK is two, um, of course, this base station needs to be picked a be, a between the base station with the largest scale, uh, scale fitting coefficient. Um, so uh, if we order the base station, we, we introduce an ordering coefficients, OK, uh, order K, that is an operator that goes from 1 to M to 1 to M, but order the base station 
with uh, in decreasing order in terms of the beta, we can select the first MK base station in this ordering. So we can pick the MK base station with the largest large scale fading coefficient. Uh, so in this case, we can define a, another set uh, L of K that contains the base station that serve the user K. So in my example, this LK contain two base stations. Of course, this base station needs to cooperate and needs to know uh, what are the signal we are transmitting to the user K. And we, are no, we have to know also what is the uh, synchronization that we have to take care of. Because of course, this serving is both on the downlink, but also on the uplink. So we have then to receive this data and um, transmit this data over fiber optic cable to the central processing unit in order to define the estimation of the signal that the user transmits. So this is the concept of cooperation between base station, net pro network, MIMO, cloud, uh, cloud run, uh, a lot of kind of uh, names of this topic. And you will discuss this with Professor Internado that gives you first a, a discussion about cooperation and what are the, the different names of uh, the cooperation between base station. And then you will discuss about cell-free massive MIMO, that is the evolution of massive MIMO. So for now, we focus on the non-cooperative base station case. So uh, all the system model that I, the system and signal model that I uh, will discuss now is concentrated on this part. So um, the first thing, as I said before, the, uh, we work in a coherence block. So we need to work uh, to first estimate the channel. Um, so when you estimate the channel, you have in a uplink training, um, uplink training uh, uh, coefficient uh, and an uplink training phase. So we have that the users transmit data on the uplink. This data needs to be known, these are bio sequences, has to be known to the base station. So um, the dimension, as I said before, the dimension in time frequency complex samples of the channel coherence length is known as tau c. So we need, in order to use this channel, we need that the length of the uplink training tau p is low, but considerably lowest with respect to tau c. Um, so the pilot sequence transmitted by the users can be chosen by can be chosen in uh, in a set of tau p orthogonal sequences. So assume that you have tau p um, sequence with length tau p. Uh, for example, uh, this tau p can be 16, 32, um, whatever, uh, or also different numbers. Um, but if you have, for example, tau p that is a power of 2, you can, for example, define tau p as orthogonal sequences using, for example, Adamard matrices with matrices with plus one and minus one in order to have columns that are orthogonal. So you can pick, for example, this uh, phi tau p, different columns of this Hadamard matrix. If you have that tau p is not, uh, is not a, a, a multiple or multiple of two, you can, of course, contain, obtain uh, orthogonal, um, orthogonal sequences. And you can, in general, you can see that these orthogonal sequences can be also complex. So in this case, you have more degree of freedom to design the orthogonality between uh, between uh, sequences. So in general, we say that uh, we have tau p different orthogonal sequences designed how we can how we we want to design this these orthogonal sequences. The, same, the most important thing is that this this sequence must be orthogonal. Of course, uh, orthogonal and unit norm. So orthonormal sequences. So, um, of course, uh, in a general situation, you have that the number of users is considerably higher with respect to tau p. And it should be a, a good assumption because uh, you can serve more users in, uh, in the same coherence block. So, uh, in general, if the tau p is 16, you can serve, for example, 20, 30 users. So, you, uh, you have to reuse, you have to assign the same sequence to different users. So you have at the end of the story, some contamination, some interference. So um, if we uh, uh, say that uh, phi k, this phi k is the sequence assigned to a user k, that is one sequence picked from this set. So it's one of the tau p possible orthogonal sequences. You have that the signal received at the amped base station during the uplink training, so the, the users transmit an amount of power that we call eta k, uh, multiplied by phi k, where phi k is the 
sequence assigned to the user k. So uh, if, each we are, if we have k users, so users in this cardinality, in this, in this uh, calligraphic k, that is the set of all the users that we have in our system, in our multicellular system, we have that each base station receive, of course, the signal over all the um, transmitted by all the users, because these signals are transmitted simultaneously. So um, the signal received by the base station can be written like the sum over k in the calligraphic k of eta k square root of eta k, that is the power that each user uh, that each user use to transmit um, to transmit pilot sim symbol, gkm that is the uplink channel between the k user and the empty base station, and phi k emission that is the pilot plus some noise. Um, so uh, the first thing that the base station does is to project, in order to estimate the channel of the Kate generic user, the base station projects this observation, the, the signal that it observes, over the pilot of the user K, because the base station knows wh uh, what are the pilot that each, each user are using, because now the, the thing that we want to estimate, the thing that uh, at which we want to, to to pay attention is the channel, not the symbol we are transmitting. So in this in this reasoning, we uh, in this uh, uplink training phase, we transmit no symbol, and we, in order to estimate the channel during the uplink and downlink, we know the channel and we want to estimate symbols. So uh, the ant base station can estimate the channel vectors g k m over all the k. Of course, the uh, if uh, the assignment is does or is done over the, uh, is done over uh, over the largest large scale fading coefficient, and we assume that these large large scale fading coefficient are known in NMMC channel estimation. This is the uh, major assumption. Uh, we can firstly assign user to the base station, so we know k of m, uh, uh, capital k, um, calligraphic k of m, that is the set of the users served by the mt base station, and the base station, of course, estimate the channel only of the user that that it uh, it take care. Um, so uh, look at the y hat km, that is the projection of ym over the pilot of the user k. So of course we have some useful signal, that is the eta k multiplied by what we want to estimate, plus some interference, plus noise. Of course, this interference, we have that some phi are orthogonal and some phi are not. So this useful interference contain the uh, channel transmitted the the channel between the amp base station and the other users that use the same pilot phi k so the the orthogonal the uh, the pilots that are not orthogonal to phi k so um, if we are taken from an orthogonal pilot set so the uh, the same sequence as phi k so um we have some useful signal interference and noise um, then we, uh, when we speak about the channel estimation, the LMMC channel estimation, we can see and we can quantify what is this interference in order to take this interference into account when we estimate the channel. Regarding the uh, system model for the downlink data transmission, we have that the uh, base station transmit data and the user receive data. Uh, in this case, we have the base station transmit data um, uh, to users that are in, in, uh, in, the, um, in the set calligraphic K of M, that is the set of users served by the, um, the base station M that remember that, uh, uh, remind that are selected by the largest large scale fading coefficient. Um, so transmit some um, power, uh, the beamforming WKM, the beamforming vector that is an NM beamforming vector that we can design following some uh, some characteristic and the symbol xk downlink that is the symbol on downlink intended to the user k um, we have to also to take care about power how much power we are transmitting because in general in downlink we have uh, uh, also in uplink but in downlink we have uh, um, we have to take care about the power constraint because we are transmitting signal but, but also beamforming so we have to take care about how much power we are transmitting and uh, we have to take care that this amount, amount of power we are transmitting should be less than uh, a maximum power available at the base station so um, if we uh, evaluate the um, average of the sm 
norm, the norm of the, uh, the norm square of the SM, we have the average power that the base station transmit uh, in this um, in this case. So we have that this is the sum over the user that the base station is served, multiplied by the coefficient eta k m dowling, multiplied by gamma. Gamma is the average of uh, wk emission, so the uh, the average of the beamforming emission beamforming. So it's the average of the norm of the beamforming that we are transmitting. So uh, of course this average has different expression depending on the beamforming techniques. Uh, but if we assume that the beamforming is uh, normalized, so for example we have uh, we can think to uh, a beamforming that is normalized by its its channel. Um, we have that uh, this gamma km is one, and in particular we have uh, that we have to control eta km downlink in order to do not exceed eta m downlink that is the maximum power that that the base station can transmit so um looking to the um it's uh, x hat downlink n so the uh, symbol received by the user k uh, on the downlink this symbol is the of course this base station receive the symbol transmitted by all the m, m base station in the system, because of course we are in the same time frequency, time frequency slot, so we have interference. Uh, this sim symbol, so the SMN is the symbol transmitted, is the signal transmitted by the base station. This symbol is uh, arrived to the base station, to the user, you, with the channel GKM emission. So GKM emission is the downlink channel. Given the TDD assumption, uh, we have that this channel is the emission on the channel on the uplink, plus some noise. Um, here we have so some uh, so we have some useful signal. So the signal XK downlink transmitted by the base station MK because we say that MK is the only one base station because we have no cooperation is the only one base station that is serving user K. Um, plus some interference. This interference is given by the communication of all the other users with their own serving base station. Um, of course, the user K received this contribution with the channel be between its own, so GK, MJ, where, so the channel between the user and the base station that are serving the, us the user J, because this, all these base stations transmit some signals to their intended users. So, useful signal, interference, and noise. Regarding the uplink data transmission, in the uplink data transmission, something similarly happens, but in this case, the, the users are transmitting, so we have a model, a system model, similarly to the one of uplink training, because we have that the user transmit data with uh, a parameter with a, a power coefficient, uh, eta k, uh, uplink, and transmit using the uplink channel GKM and transmitting some data on the uplink. Of course, and also in this case, we assume that the base station needs to estimate the channel transmitted by the user K and use the combining or post-coding vector that we know as DKMK in general. So this vector is an NM dimensional vector that combines the symbol received over all the antennas in order to um, to uh, receive uh, in order to receive and estimate the channel transmitted by the user k. So and now we will see how this can be designed in different way. Um, so in this case we have that also in this case we have some interference, uh, some uh, useful signal interference and noise. The interference is given by the communication of uh, all the other users with their own serving base station. And of course, this sig signal arrived to the base station, arrived to the um, base station multiplied by uh, their own channel, because the channel is between the J user and their own base station, and the base station MK uh, that is looking to this interference that is receiving this data, uh, multiplied, pre multiplied by the, the same post coding vector or combining vector. Uh, of course, in this case, in the Apple case, we have also a, a combination of noise because we take all the symbol, the signal that the base station received that contains some noise, and also this noise is combined 
with the same combiner. Combiner. So here we have a kind of noise increasing. That then, depending on the on how we uh, we um, uh, design the KMK in order to see how much this noise is. So um, two important characteristics that we already discussed last time uh, for massive MIMO are channel hardening and favorable propagation. Um, the channel hardening is the um, characteristic of massive MIMO that makes a fading channel behave as deterministic. So this property alleviates the need of combating small scale fading because the, uh, using a large, a large number of antennas, we have that uh, um, in formula, we have that the norm of GKM over the average norm of GKM tends to one. Of course, it's not equal to one, but then ten to one almost surely when the number of antennas grows large. So um, a propagation channel GKM provides asymptotic channel hardening if we have this property. So this definition say that uh, GKM of an arbitrary fading channel is close to its mean when there are a lot of antennas. Uh, but this should be interpreted in the sense that the relative deviation for the average channel gain vanishes asymptotically. This does not mean that the channel tends to its, its mean because we have that, that both the channel and the means when the number of antennas is very large goes to infinity. So we have that not infinite tend to infinite. Uh, so we have that this ratio tends to one. Um, one can interpret the results that one over an M of GKM squared minus one over M of average of GKM norm square tends to zero when the number of antennas tends to infinite. So this is another, this relationship is another relationship that I report here in blue. But the most important thing is that we cannot interpret that GKM tends to average of GKM, expectation of GKM, because we have that both of these, of these, these things tend to infinite. The concept of favorable propagation means that the directions of two UE channels asymptotically are orthogonal. So the main idea and the main thing that um, makes massive MIMO too much uh, investigated in literature is that is given by both channel hardening but also by favorable propagation because uh, in this case we have that uh, the um, um, the uh, channels between different users tends to be orthogonal. So if we use simply channel matched beam forming of maximum ratio combining uh, and transmission as, as we want to, uh, to refer to this, we have that the, uh, these channels are orthogonal. So we can reduce interference with a simple maximum ratio transmission. So using uh, as beam forming and combining exactly the channel that we estimate. Of course, this is an asymptotical relationship. So if we use 100 antenna, we have a little bit amount of interference. Uh, we have not no interference. So uh, this property make it easier to, for the base station to mitigate interference when be, between users. Um, and the concept in formula, the concept of favorable propagation is that the pair of channel GKM and GJM to the base station M provide asymptotically favorable propagation if we have that the ratio between the product GKM emission GJM over the mean of GKM, the expectation of GKM square, non-square, and expectation of GJM non-square tends to zero when the number of antennas tends to infinite. So uh, we are saying that this, uh, the product between these two, the normalized product of these two channels tends to zero. So this definition says that the inner product of the normalized channels goes asymptotically to zero. Uh, since the norm of the channel grows with an M, the favorable propagation does not imply that GKM and GJM are orthogonal. Uh, the inner product of G GKM and GJM are orthogonal because they, are, they grow a lot. Uh, but we have orthogonality between channel directions because if we normalize a channel by its own norm, we have a kind of channel directions. Um, but so we have that the channel directions are orthogonal, but not the channel responses. 
So uh, these are two parameters. These are two um, characteristics of massive memo system, channel hardening and favorable propagation that are uh, containing, that are a consequence of the fact that uh, we have a lot of antennas, of course, um, and can, uh, can improve the performance of massive MIMO with a simple processing, with a simple linear processing. Because if we do a linear processing with 10 antennas, and we, if we do a linear process, the same linear pro processing with 100 antennas, we can have that the quantity of interference that we can experience in both the cases is considerably different. And in particular, if you have more uh, antennas, if you have 100 antennas, we have less interference. Because we have that, we are not exactly in the condition of channel hardening and favorable propagation because 100 is not infinite, but we are tending to having the concept of channel hardening and favorable propagation. So we are uh, we are approximating the channel hardening and favorable propagation, but we are already observing some benefits of these characteristics. So. Um, Starting now with some kind of processing, the kind of processing that I provide here to you, the MMC channel estimation is the most famous channel estimation used in Massive MIMO. But this is again, the, not the only one. Uh, because if you look to the MMC channel estimation or for example, channel estimation in Massive MIMO, you can find a lot of different proposals, um, a lot of different solutions. Uh, but in general, the uh, MMC channel estimation is the one more used. And also uh, with Professor Interdonato, you can see that also in Set Free Massive MIMO, the, this, the MMC channel estimation remains the most used one. So the MMC estimator of the channel response GKM, of course, we already designed it and we already introduced it this symbol, this relationship that is the projection of the symbol received by the user M over the pilots of the user K. Um, and the channel is a realization of a random variable. Thus, Bayesian estimators are desirable, desirable since they, they can take into account, into account the statistical distribution of the variables. So we want to find the kind, we want to apply MMC channel estimation to this kind of observator. Um, so Bayesian estimator required that the distribution are known. So we have that the channel model, we are assuming MMC channel estimator requires that we have knowledge about large scale fading coefficient because we, we want to have that the statistical, the statistics of what we are estimating is more or less known. So uh, since we know that, for example, in a relay channel, we know that HKM is a uh, relay vector with zero with zero mean and unit variance entries, or for example, if we know that HKM is a correlated vector with such correlation matrices, uh, we can we can use MMC channel estimation because we have some idea on what we are estimating to. Another thing that we can do is, for example, using a pilot match situation. For example, taking this observation here, dividing by eta k and looking to what you are, what you have. Of course, here you have some, some useful signal plus some interference plus noise. But with a pilot, if you, if you don't know nothing about channel, this is the simplest thing that you can do. So simply project the symbol on the pilot and dividing by the power that the user are transmitting, are using to transmit and have a kind of idea on what channel you have. But if you have an idea of uh, what is the statistics of the channel, you can have a better estimation with MMC approach. So the MMC approach of GKM is the vector GKM hat that minimizes the minimum square error. Uh, the minimum square error is the expectation of GKM minus GKM hat norm square. So you can uh, refer to fundamentals of statistical signal processing for a further detail regarding the MMC channel estimation, but I think that all of you know what is an MMC estimator. Uh, so assume, so how we can obtain this formula? Because solving this problem, taking the estimation, doing the gradient between, uh, with respect to, um, do, doing the gradient with respect to what we, if we assume a linear estimator here, we are assuming that we are taking the observator and pre-multiplying by a matrix. If we minimize with respect to these matrix the gradient of the MC, 
you can find some expression. So the expression that we use here for the linear MMC channel estimation is that G hat KM is the um, correlation matrix of your observation inverts multiplied by the matrix of the um, uh, correlation matrix between the symbol and the observation and the estimator and the um, uh, and what we want to estimate multiplied by the observator so this is the expression of uh, uh, mmc channel estimation now in the particular case we can uh, write the expression of uh, autocorrelation matrix of the observ uh, the observable and auto and correlation matrix between the observable and the channel uh, we have that uh, given the received pilot signal so the signal received and projected on the pilot uh, we can see that the um, estimate the, the this correlation matrix can be written in this way because we have that the sum over eta eta i the um uh, the average the expectation of gim gim emission is identity matrix with uh, uh, beta e, e, uh, i m on the diagonal so it's beta i m i and m and then you have this scalar coefficient that is the product between the um the between the um, uh, pilot sequences plus the um, covariance matrix of noise here we have the um, uh, the uh, correlation between the correlation matrix between the observable and the channel and this is eta k bkm y and m because here you have uncorrelated channel the channel is uncorrelated between different users so we have that this part of interference here on average vanishes because we have that the channels are zero mean with such variance uh, so finally we can have that uh, in the particular case of relay fading with uh, of relay fading with such uh, um, uh, square root of beta km of variance with large scale fading coefficient, the uh, uh, estimate of the LMC estimate of the channel is a scalar, the given by the ratio between eta k beta, beta km over such interference plus noise, multiplied by y at km, so the observable. So uh, we have a scalar that multiply the observable. Of course, this color takes into account noise and interference. So we have a better performance with respect to taking on simply YKM because here we are taking into account the interference. So um, focusing on the received pilot signal, we discussed last time that we have the concept of pilot contamination. That is the interference between the user that use the same pilots. So um, if we have orthogonal pilot sequence, if we as, uh, assign all orthogonal pilot sequence to a user, so for example, we have tau p equal to k, equal to the number of users in overall the multi-cell system, we have that the product between phi i emission phi k is zero for all i different to k. So all this sum disappear. Uh, but if, so in this case, we have the observation is the useful signal plus noise. So we can have the better estimation that we can think to. The best situation to have an estimation about, about something because of course noise is always present. Uh, so if two users, only two users in the system use the same pilot sequence um, from the common pilot book P, um, tau P, we have that phi k, and, uh, phi k and phi j are equal. So in this case, we have that the particular expression of this formula is observable plus the, sing, the uh, channel of the user that use the same pilot of the observable, so the user that use pilot phi j that is equal to phi k, plus noise. So in this case, we have that uh, if, we est if we estimate the sum, so we are estimating the channel between the uh, the channel between the base, the, the user that we, that we want to estimate plus some additional, additional um, uh, disturbance. So this additional disturbance, of course, uh, is not in all the cases too uh, too bad in order to, uh, to to not be able to estimate the channel. Because, for example, if we have a large multicellular multicellular environment and you assign the same pilot, is the same concept of frequency reuse. Uh, 
So if you assign the same, uh, the same pilot to two users that are considerably far uh, between them, so they are served to two base stations, they are in two different cells, we have that you observe a strong channel, that is the channel that you are intended to estimate, plus some disturbance that is very low in terms of power. So you have this, this, uh, this, this disturbance, but you are not uh, a big problem about this representation, about this signal. So um, the, how we can reduce the pilot contamination in general doing a kind of smart pilot assignment. So assigning the same pilots to users that are considerably far. So in general, we have that, uh, uh, in general, we have that we observe some pilot contamination when we, as when, when we, assign, uh, when we assign uh, the same pilot to more than one user. But, uh, so in this case, we have a sum over the users in UK if we uh, call UK the set of users that use the same pilot sequence as the Kate, except the Kate one. So you uh, observe also here same pilot contamination, but if the users at which we assign the same pilot are far, geographically far, given to the path loss and the attenuation, we have that the uh, amount of pilot contamination that we experience is very low. So, uh, so this is the, the concept that, uh, that I experience now. So if I am here at the cell edge, for example, I experience this, the, um, the pilot transmission, but this user transmits also unintentional uh, pilots to another base station. So this base station estimates the sum of the two. If the two users are considerably far, this contribution is strongest with respect to this other contribution. So at the end of the story, I have a better, uh, I have a good estimation. So my Nepal contamination is present, but it's not so heavy. So um, one of the key characteristics of the pilot contamination phenomenon is that the UE transmit the same pilot, contaminate each other ch channel estimate. So the interference not only reduce the estimation quality, but also make the channel that are statistically dependent. So uh, the true channel, uh, um, although the true channels are statistically independent, so we are introducing a, a, a dependency between uh, the channels of the users that use the same pilot. So pilot contamination has an, an important impact beyond the channel estimation because the pilot contamination makes it uh, particularly hard to the base station for the base station to mitigate interference between different users that use the same pilot. So when massive memo was introduced, pilot contamination was the limit, the uh, main characteristic and limiting factor of massive memo. Then you can find some. Uh, uh, in the evolution of massive of, you know, of investigation and research of massive MIMO, you can find that there are some ways to uh, mitigate the pilot contamination. One way is, for example, to have a smart pilot assignment. Uh, but uh, but is the, um, the important thing is that uh, uh, while in the, you can uh, reduce interference thanks to the favorable propagation, um, you cannot reduce the pilot contamination increasing the number of, of base station of antennas at the base station. We have to, to do some additional things in order to reduce pilot contamination. It's not something that you can uh, that you can reduce simply by increasing the number of antennas. So the phenomenon, of course, is not unique to massive MIMO, but it, it exists in most cellular environments because in all the cellular environments, we first estimate the channel. Um, but uh, it can be can have a higher impact on massive MIMO than on conventional networks because uh, the large number of UEs uh, requires the pilot sequence to be reused more frequently um, and uh, in space, and partially because the signal processing in massive MIMO is particularly good at suppressing interference between users with orthogonal pilots, because we have that if the channels and the channel estimates are statistically independent, we can have and uh, we can use the favorable propagation to, to reduce interference with very simple process. So um, now I will discuss. I want to discuss some something very briefly because here the uh, the concept of achievable spectral efficiency is quite 
large, um, to how to uh, quantify the spectral efficiency of a massive MIMO system. Because until now we say, okay, massive MIMO can, include, can increase the spectral efficiency, can give us a very good performance, and that's true. But how we can quantify this performance? This is what we are what we are doing with achievable spectral efficiency. So um, for uh, uh, the first thing for the benchmarking purposes, we start considering the ideal case in which we know the, we know perfectly the channel. So in downlink, uh, uh, the estimate of the signal intended to the gate user can be written in this way, and we already discussed this expression before in the signal model on downlink. Um, and we have that the spectral efficiency in the case of perfect CSI is that the power, so it's that uh, the ratio between how much uh, how much uh, complex samples we use for downlink over how much complex sample we have in the coherence block. So this ratio, of course, takes into account a kind of inefficiency of the fact that we have a coherence block of tau C samples. You use a part for uh, estimating the channel, a part for transmitting on uplink, and a part for transmitting on downlink. Uh, log two of one plus SINR. So how we can write the SINR? Simply the, sing the um, power of the intended signal plus the power of, uh, over the power of interference plus the power of noise. So this is true for the case of uh, perfect CSI because in this case we can simply differentiate between what is signal, what is interference, and what is noise, because we know perfectly the channel. We have not pilot contamination, we have no problems regarding the channel estimation because we can perfectly know the channel. So the symbol, the uh, simple expression of achievable spectral efficiency in the case of perfect CSI is this one. So it's a factor that takes into account the efficiency, uh, how much efficient we are using the coherence style, the coherence block to transmit down the symbol. Um, log two of one plus SNR, in which the, in the SNR we can simply and directly differentiate between what is interference, what is noise, and what is useful signal. A similar approach, you can, you can have a similar expression also for uplink, uh, because this is the expression of the signal on uplink that we discussed before, and si simply we can differentiate between what is signal, what is interference, and what is noise, so in case of perfect CSI, we have exactly this expression. So the problem is when we are not knowing the channel. So we are estimating the channel, so we have to take into account some uncertainty in the channel estimation. So in general, when channel coefficients are not perfectly known, it is not clear what is signal, what is interference in the expression of the received signal, because here we have some correlation, some uh, uh, relationships between different the channel estimate that we that we have done. So uh, since the fact that we are designing the postcoding vector and the informing vector D here W um, um, W K and K, uh, we are designing precoding and postcoding of informing and combining as you as you want. Uh, given on the channel estimation, because the base station does not know the exact channel. Base station can estimate the an estimate of the channel. We are in, in introducing some uh, some um, correlation between the real channel and the channel on the other users, because this WKMK, if for example, is it is uh, G hat KMK. G hat KMK is correlated with the channel of other users that use the same pilot. So we are not, no, we have, mm, we have that what we think that is in uh, useful signal really contains some contribution of other channels from other users. So, in particular, for imperfect CSAI, the intuitive notion of spectral efficiency are, in general, not rigorously related to a corresponding notion of information theoretic achievable spectral efficiency. So the achievable spectral efficiency that we can think is not really achievable. Uh, so what can be done uh, is to derive upper bounds and lower bounds of achievable spectral efficiency. And for the upper bounds, I will provide you a formula very sim similar to very similar to the one of the perfect CSI contains only some expectations. 
uh, and lower bound for the spectral efficiency use the concept of challenge hardening and uh, in order to um, to obtain this achievable spectral efficiency for massive MIMO, that is more or less the main um, performance, the main performance measures used in uh, um, for the comparison between different uh, different precoding and combating techniques. So um, in the downlink spectral efficiency, we assume that uh, um, um, we assume that we are in the concept, uh, we have so substantial channel hardening and we consider some precoding normalization in order to have that uh, the precoder, the normal the precoder is equal to one. Um, but also if the norm the precoder is not equal to one, we have to take into account the parameter gamma for the power control because we cannot exceed a, a maximum available power that the base station can transmit. So uh, given the expression of received signal, uh, an upper bound of the um, downlink spectral efficiency is the one of the uplink, uh, is the one of the perfect CSI, introducing some expectations. But these expectations are made over <coughs> fast fading coefficients. So we have here a kind of, we are, um, uh, we are uh, averaging the SNR uh, in order to um, in order to have a good uh, in order to have a good um, um, a good idea on how it works because in perfect CSI we have one realization and this realization is completely perfect uh, so we know completely perfectly this uh, this uh, realization. In the case in which we want to find a kind of upper bound of the achievable spectral efficiency, we can in inc include the um, average over the um, average over the different uh, the different um, fast fading realization. This average can be computed. Um, numerically, for example, using some Monte Carlo simulation in which we have uh, you are this expression of the SNR for some values, of some realization of the fast fading, and then you average this realization and you can have an upper bound of the real performance. Of course, sometimes the upper bound of real performance can give you an idea and can give you how to compare different, uh, different um, for example, precoding, combining on signal processing or signal processing um, relationship. But uh, um, in general, a lower bound expression of the downlink spectral efficiency can be a better uh, figure of merit to see how much you are gaining with your, uh, with your, uh, uh, with your environment, with your, uh, with your technology. So a lower bound can be represented using the um, hardening lower bound. Uh, and we are saying that the receiving signal can be written in this way in which simply we are adding this contribution. So we are adding to the expression of XK downlink the expectation of the usable signal and we are subtracting the expectation of the usable signal. And we uh, recombine this relationship accordingly. So we can see that we have the expectation of the useful signal, and this is what the base station can know, because the base station can know the statistics of the, uh, the statistics of the signal, uh, because we say that we are using MC channel estimation, so we can know the statistic of the signal, or the statistic not of the signal, of the channel. Um, then we have some beamforming uncertainty, that is the um useful signal minus the mean of the useful signal over interference so of course if you have a high channel hardening we have that this contribution and this contribution so this difference is very low and so this contribution is very near to the real channel so because of that this is known as hardening bound so given to this expression and given the fact that the base station and the user in this assumption, we are in this situation, we are doing this assumption that the user can know the statistic of the useful signal. Um, we can see that the sum of the second, third, and fourth segment is treated as effective noise. So we have that the spectral efficiency uh, lower bound is given by the absolute value of decay, where decay is again this, the mean of the useful signal, over the mean of the informing uncertainty plus the mean of interference plus noise. So this is the, um, the uh, expression of the hardening bound for a lower bound of the spectral efficiency. Now, 
given to this expression, of course, we, we have to do some computations to evaluate this expression. Of course, you can evaluate this with the Monte Carlo simulation. And in general, if you have some very complex beamforming expressions, so for example, here you are using some uh, beamforming uh, uh, with different uh, kind of uh, representation, for example, a regular eyes, uh, partic a particular beamforming that has not a simple expression, uh, you, can, you can, of course, compute this hardening lower bound with uh, Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, but there are some cases in which, for example, you are using maximum ratio transmission, zero forcing, or uh, um, MMC maybe, uh, in which you can you can obtain a closed form of this expression. So we can have a direct closed form of this uh, expression here that gives you exactly how the spectral efficiency is. So you can simply uh, write a very simple MATLAB uh, or Python code in order to report the curve of the spectral efficiency that you have in your system. Uh, if you have very simple beamforming, beamforming vectors. If you have beamforming vectors that are quite involved, so you cannot close this expectation uh, by, um, by writing it on paper, um, you can evaluate this expect expectation in, uh, uh, this expectation in, um, uh, by Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, for example, uh, sometimes I, I did this with uh, uh, when I assume uh, users with a lot of antennas or uh, with a different kind of informing that involves some particular uh, particular techniques. Uh, so, and this uh, this, this informing can give you a good idea of how the performance of the of the system works. So um, this expression, okay, here I reported what I what I'm saying now. Uh, you can have a different, a similar approach also for uplink. So for uplink, you can define an upper bound with uh, similarly, so uh, adding an expectation outside, this is the upper bound. Regarding the lower bound, you can do exactly the same processing of uh, adding and subtracting the uh, expectation of the uh, useful signal. And assuming that the base station can know the expectation of the useful signal, you can have this expression for the uplink, also for the uplink. So it's very similar. Um, it's very similar. And this expression um, uh, is known as uh, use and then forget bound. Uh, and is deterministic again, and you can uh, evaluate this uh, expectation using Monte Carlo simulation, depending on how complex is your uh, your the combining vector. Or in the case of uh, um, LMMC channel estimation and uh, LMMC channel estimation and MRT on also zero forcing, you can close this. Uh, you can obtain a closed form of this expression, and you can simply. Uh, write a, a very simple function that represent and plot your performance. So, um, given the fact that we have uh, a really um, relationship, a strong relationship between uplink and downlink uh, expressions of uh, um, uh, of um, spectral efficiency, uh, we can see that we have a kind of symmetry that create a fundamental connection between spectral efficiency in uplink and in downlink because in uplink uh, we have that uh, the user transmits signal this signal arrives to the base station multiplied by the uplink channel and the base station use a combining vector to project this signal over the antennas in uplink in downlink you have that the base station transmit with such beamforming vector the beamforming vector and the overall signal arrive to the user multiplied by the downlink channel. So, and since we are in TDD, so uplink and downlink channel are related by a simple emission relationship, um, we have that um, this relationship is known as uplink-downlink duality. Um, so, uh, in particular, given a properly defined power allocation technique and the following beamforming design, so if we assume that you can uh, design a, a combining vector D, K, M, K, uh, you can simply define a beamforming vector, taking the combining, normalizing this, because we say that the normalization in the beamforming is important in order to allow the power allocation to satisfy the uh, constraint regarding the maximum transmit power. Um, we can obtain that uh, doing so uh, some uh, power allocation, some uh, power allocation technique, and some and this approach for the and the choice of this approach for uh, for the um, 
uh, beam forming and combining, we can obtain that the spectral efficiency in downing is equal to the spectral efficiency in uplink. Uh, this question regarding the lower bound. Uh, so the uplink downlink duality um, motivates, uh, motivates a simple precoding design principle that say select the downlink precoding vector based on the uplink basic combining vectors. So why this is important? Because we can see uh, a lot of different combining and thus precoding techniques and see how this works and how this performs. Uh, so, in particular, uh, we already showed some, uh, some uh, results last time, uh, and we say that uh, we, are, we can be a lot of uh, different, uh, uh, different preconing design. For example, that there are some preconing design based on successive interference, uh, preconing design based on uh, different kind of, uh, uh, of situations, but maybe the most famous ones are the following, um, in which I ordered the, this uh, precoding and combining uh, um, with decreasing complexity. Um, in particular, the multi-cell NMC uh, assume knowledge of the, uh, so in different, uh, in decreasing uh, um, order of complexity and also the amount of knowledge that we need at the base station in order to implement these uh, uh, precoding and combining vectors. Um, so the uh, multicellular MMC assume knowledge of the base station of all the channel estimate of the users in the system. So we need to know all the channel estimates. So one base station, if we have a multicellular environment with 10 cells, this base station needs to know its own estimation of the channel in the cell, but also all the estimation of the other base station in the other cell, cell of the, all the users. So it maximizes the instantaneous SNR, but minimizes the um, minimum square error of the data, data detection. So this is the complex, the most complex one, but also the best, better one, the best performing one. Then we have the single cell MMC. Single cell MMC is the approximation of multi-cell MMC in which we have knowledge of all the channel estimate of the users in its cell. So um, it is generally different from the multi-cell MMC in terms of performance, in terms of complexity, um, and has a, a substantially weaker ability to suppress interference from interference UE in other cells, of course, because we are assuming less knowledge and less complexity. Um, regarding the zero forcing, the zero forcing use the channel estimate to null interference. So if the channel estimates are not good, uh, corrupted by noise and pilot contamination, the performance of zero forcing strongly degrades. Um, regularized zero forcing is a zero forcing that takes into, into account also the transmit power in order to uh, reduce the problem of noise enhancement, because you know that the zero forcing has the problem of noise enhancement in general, in general also in MIMO. Um, and uh, using a kind of regularization factor, we can have a better performance in, in, this, uh, in these terms. Um, then we have maximum, maximum ratio, that is the simplest one, uh, that use the local channel estimate between each, each base station and UE. And UE. So the beamforming and combining vector are exactly the channel estimate at the base station. So regarding complexity, as I said, I ordered the, um, um, the beamforming vectors using a decreasing order. So I, uh, we have that the multi-cell MMC is the most complex one. Then we have the single cell MMC um, in this case. When, uh, in this case, we have that uh, um, we have 100 antennas and we are varying the number of users. Of course, increasing the number of users the complexity of the channel estimation increase because we have to manage such uh, the complexity of the beamforming. Sorry, we have to manage such more users. So we have a lot of complex multiplications in terms of uh, performing this kind of beamforming techniques. Um, so we have uh, NMC that is the most complicated, the most complex one, both in the case in which we are ten users varying the number of antennas and which we are we have 100 antennas varying the number of users. Um, so uh, in, the, uh, in the case of uh, 
in, in both, so in the simplest one is, of course, the uh, maxim, maximum ratio transmission. Regarding the uh, complexity of uh, regularized zero forcing and zero forcing are the same because we are measuring here performance in terms of number of complex multiplications. And since zero forcing and regularized zero forcing simply differ from a uh, um, scalar coefficient that takes into account the transmit power, the number of complex multiplication in the two cases uh, is the same. Uh, regarding the uh, performance that we obtain, of course, I say that uh, the MMC is the complex, most complex one, but it's also the best performing one because we have here that the average sum spectral efficiency in terms of bit per second per hertz per cell versus the number of antennas, we have that the multi-cell MMC is the most performing one. Uh, we can see also that the zero forcing and regularized zero forcing performs more or less in the same way for large number of antennas. For low number of antennas, we have that the regularized is better that, than the zero forcing because here we have this additional factor that uh, suppresses from the problem of zero forcing related to the noise enhancement. Um, and we can also see that the worst one is the um, ma maximum ratio. And we have that for very low number of antennas, maximum ratio is better with respect to, um, uh, with respect to uh, the zero forcing because the zero forcing is not able with less antennas and is not able to suppress interference between, for example, 15 users when you have only 10 antennas. So because, because of that, in this case, we have that the maximum ratio transmission is better with respect to zero forcing. Regarding the um, CDF uh, of uh, uh, uplink spectral efficiency, in, the, uh, in this example, we have M equal 10. And in this figure, uh, it is reported also the, uh, the expression of the correlated fading. Um, and we can see that the correlated fading, so MMC, uh, channel, uh, M, the MMC is better with respect to, um, to the other one. Of course, so we have that the maximum ratio is the worst one. And the regularized zero forcing and MMC, here we have a, uh, we have that uh, the MMC is always best, is always the best, the best one. Uh, and we can see that also the case of correlated fading with respect to the case of uncorrelated fading is better in terms of performance. Uh, that's why um, we have that for correlated fading, uh, we have a best environment because knowing uh, how the channel changes between different antennas we know how the channel changes between different antennas so um, we have more information regarding channels respect to the case of uncorrelated fading in which we do not know nothing because the channel over different antennas is completely uh, is completely independent and follow a simple channel uh, simple complex normal relationship with zero uh, between zero uh, and one with zero mean and one variance, so we have a lot of, um, of variability. Um, so the, um, regarding the downlink, we have a similar performance also for downlink because we say that we have uplink downlink duality. So uh, the, what we said for uplink more or less is, is the same for uh, of what we said for downlink. Um, and um, this closed more or less the, uh, re the relationship between the, uh, the um, uh, relationship between uh, uh, massive MIMO and spectral efficiency. But as I said be before, and also as Doga pointed out before, um, what we have to take into account is the energy efficiency. Uh, because of course, the, um, the idea of improving the uh, performance using spectral efficiency, using a lot of antennas, using uh, whatever we want. Um, we have that, uh, uh, using whatever we want, we have that uh, um, this implies some problems in terms of, uh, uh, this implies some problems in terms of, uh, um, sorry, um, in terms of uh, what, um, how much power we are consuming. Um, so the uh, main idea is that here in this graph, I report uh, how much power a generic base station, how much power we are consuming at the generic base station. Um, we can see that um, we have this graph, the largest part of the amount of power at the base station is consumed by the power amplification because we have 8% uh, of power supply. 
10% of signal processing. So depending on what, uh, what is the, how much signal processing we are using, uh, how much complex signal processing we are using, uh, the 17% is the air cooling and the 65% is the power amplifier. So Massive MIMO aims at evolving the coverage area of the base station by using an array with 100 or more antennas and transmitting with a relative low power. The area throughput is improved using by multiplexity gain, but the throughput gains provided by Massive MIMO came from deploying more hardware because we have multiple RF chains, so multiple power amplifiers per base station, uh, and digital signal processing based on SDMA, space division multiple access, combining per coping, which in turn increase the power consumption per base station. So we are uh, increasing, if we think to the uh, definition of energy efficiency that I will, uh, how we will discuss, discuss, we have that we are increasing spectral efficiency, but we are increasing also the power consumption. So we have to take into account what happens to the ratio. So um, the overall energy efficiency of the network uh, is defined on how much energy it takes to achieve a certain amount of work. So the energy efficiency can be opt optimized only if these benefits and costs are proper properly balanced. So uh, among the different ways to define the energy efficiency of a cellular network, uh, one of the most popular definition is simply and related to this definition of spectral efficiency, uh, and is that the energy efficiency of a cellular network is the number of bits that can be reliably transmitted per unit of energy. So, uh, according to the defi definition above, uh, we define the energy efficiency as the ratio between the throughput, measured in bit per second per hertz, um, over the power consumption, that is watt per cell, so the energy efficiency is measured in bit per joule and can be seen as a benefit cost ratio where the service quality throughput is compared with the associated cost power consumption. Um, so um, we can model the power consumption uh, as follow very simply saying that the power consumption is the ATP, the effective transmit power, plus the circuit power. Um, the effective transmit power uh, needed for transmit uh, for transmission, which takes into account the efficiency of the power amplifier. Um, so we have we are, for example, transmitting 10 watts. How much power we are effectively transmit where we transmit 10 watts? So uh, the uh, how much we are spending in order to compensate the inefficiency of the power amplifier. So this is the effective transmit power. Then we have the circuit power and a common model for the circuit power is a value of fixed power, uh, where PFIX is a constant quantity, which may account for the fixed power required for control signaling and load independent power of baseband processor, backhaul back infrastructure and so on. So the uh, simplest case is PFIX, but we have some additional and different cases uh, in which we are, we want to take into account uh, more details regarding how much power we are consuming and how the power consumption consumption changes if we change our architecture. So uh, the um, a more um, a more accurate uh, model for the power consumption in Massive MIMO is the following. Uh, so uh, this is not sufficiently ac accurate for comparing system with different hardware setups. Uh, for example, we have different number of antennas and varying network load because it does not account for the power dissipation in the analog hardware and in the digital processing. So uh, taking circuit power equal to PFIX can lose the relationship between the circuit power and, for example, the number of antennas, the number of RS chains that we are using. And then we will see in the figure and in the representation how this came from to a wrong uh, came to a wrong uh, representation. In fact, the uh, CP model are needed to evaluate, the detailed CP model are needed to evaluate the power consumed by a practical network uh, and to identify the non-negligible components. In fact, a, fairy, a fairly simple polynomial CP uh, model allow for a quite realistic assessment of uh, circuit power for massive MIMO. In fact, we have that the circuit power of 
consumed by the base station J, generic base station J, is an amount of fixed power that, for example, contains the power supply needed to, uh, to, to do the alimentation to this base station. Then we have the power consumed by the transceiver chains that, of course, changes with the number of antennas. Plus the power consumed to the channel estimation. We say that we have that this needs to be to uh, the, uh, the estimation needs to be to pick it from the antennas, taken from the antennas, projected on the pilots, and then uh, we have to do some processing in order to obtain an MMC channel estimation. So we consume some power to do this. Uh, then we have coding the coding. For example, uh, we have how much power we are doing to define the code that we are that we have to use to transmit data efficiently in this uh, for this channel. For example, adaptive modulation encoding, uh, other characteristics that are good uh, things but consume power. Um, also, uh, PBH is the load dependent backhaul. What is the backhaul? Is the communication between the base station and the rest of the network. For example, the core network. So, uh, if we have a lot of power, a lot of data to transmit to the uh, to the core network, of course, we need more power to transmit this data over the fiber op optic cable that we are using, or we transmit with the same power, but, but we transmit very frequently. So, we consume very frequently more power. Uh, and also uh, power consumed by the signal processing. For example, multi-cell MMC, uh, signal processing of single-cell MMC, and so on. So we have to take into account all these characteristics. One example for the um, a wrong representation, a wrong representation of the energy efficiency. Here in this figure is reporting the uh, energy and spectral efficiency uh, trade-off. Um, so in the in, on the x-axis I have spectral efficiency. On the y-axis we have the energy efficiency uh, for different value of m. When we are assuming that the uh, circuit power is representing similar sim, uh, simply to a prefix of 10 watts. Uh, we have a bandwidth of 100 kilohertz, and all the parameters are reported here. So, spectral efficiency and energy efficiency, we have that the red curves report the maximum for different values of antennas. So, we have that this is M2 equal to, this is 10, this is 100, this is 1000. And the red curve reports the maximum point of the energy efficiency trade-off. So, it is the maximum point at which we have, we have to work. Um, so we can see that the trade-off between the, these points are increasing. So uh, the, um, in order to obtain the maximum um, energy efficiency, we can increase the maximum spectral efficiency. Because here we have that for M equal to, we have spectral efficiency of uh, more or less 3, 4.5 or 4 um, spectral efficiency and an energy efficiency of uh, that we are here, we have... Uh, five, uh, maybe four multiplied by 10 to the uh, to the four power bit per joule. So we have that this is the good, the best point at which we can work when we have only two antennas. When we arrive to 1000 antennas, we consume more or less 10 to the five. We have an energy efficiency of bit per joule, 10 to the five bit per joule. So we are good. And with a spectral efficiency of 13 bit per second per hertz. So in, um, increasing the number of antennas, we are increasing the performance in terms of energy efficiency, spectral efficiency trade-off. Um, but this graph do not take into account, does not take, take into account that uh, having more antennas, we are consuming more power. So because we are using a prefix equal to 10 watts, that is equal for the case of M equal to and equal to the case of M equal to 1000. So this graph does not take into account the additional power consumption for, for having multiple antennas at the base station. So for example, because uh, if we have multiple antennas, we consume most power in this point, transceiver chains, chains in this point, channel estimation, um, maybe in signal processing. These two values, uh, coding, decoding, and load dependent back all, maybe are not influenced, are not influenced by the highest number of antennas. But the highest number of antennas gives you the needed of use more transceiver chains, a channel estimation that is more complex, and a signal processing that is more complex. So a more realistic graph is this one. So a more realistic graph gives you the, um, uh, we have um, prefix equal to 10 watts, and we are taking into account the um, model that we have before. So we have 10 watts plus 
additional power consumed by the fact that we have more antennas, um, that we have more, uh, more antennas, and the base station is transmitting one watt. Uh, uh, so in, uh, in this case, we can see that the red points that point the energy efficiency trade-off um, are follow a decreasing relationships. So we can have, for example, that for m equal to, we are here, uh, we are in the same point like less before, more or less, but increasing the number of antennas, we have that the energy consumption, the power consumption, the denominator is increasing. So we have that, for example, for M equal to uh, 1000, we can have uh, a spectral efficiency of uh, 18 uh, bit per second per hertz, but an energy efficiency that is considerably lowest with respect to the other cases, because we have more antennas and we are consuming a lot of power. To, uh, for example, to transmit uh, uh, data, to uh, estimate the channel with 1,000 coefficient, and so on. So uh, this is this is to say to to take also a, an attention, a very few attention on the energy efficiency. But as I said before, you will discuss these aspects also related to RIS with uh, Professor Professor Zappone tomorrow. Uh, so uh, to summarize what we said. Uh, until now on Massive Mimo and um, very brief, briefly what you will say with, uh, uh, in the evolution of Massive Mimo to, uh, with Professor Interdonato tomorrow. Uh, I want firstly to uh, summarize what I said uh, during the, this lecture uh, that I hope will be interesting for you and for your future research. I know that you don't work on Massive Mimo because you work on RIS, uh, but you, you have to know what is behind RIS and what is before RIS. Um, so Massive MIMO is the uh, one of the key 5G technology, is based on uh, TDD protocol, uh, exploits channel hardening and favorable propagation because these are characteristics included in, uh, uh, in, um, in Massive MIMO in the, in, in the uh, Asymptotic, are asymptotic characteristic of massive MIMO, but you can take benefits of uh, uh, channel hardening and favorable propagation that gives you that the vector channels are pseudo orthogonal, uh, thanks to uh, also where you have, for example, 100 antennas. Um, the capacity is, of course, limited by channel coherence time, but this is more or less equal for all the um, the wireless uh, wireless communication because we have to estimate the channel and we can use the channel but of course if we have to estimate a lot of channel a lot of channel coefficient we need some time that we can uh, that we can maybe um, solve using the uplink data transmission but of course we need some pilot maybe a pilot coin a pilot uh, length that is quite longer where we have a lot of antennas um, and the pilot contamination is a problem that was uh, that is a limiting problem of uh, um, of um, massive MIMO, uh, and we say that we cannot simply solve the problem of pilot contamination simply increasing the number of antennas, but we need we need to do additional things that can go from the uh, a smart pilot assignment to uh, a problem uh, to the spatial uh, channel correlation that gives you um, a more idea on what how the channel behaves. Uh, but the uh, main the main problem of massive MIMO is the fact that if we are in a non cooperative situation, so uh, the situation that we uh, studied until now, we have that each base station serves the user in the cell and stop without cooperation with other base station. We have problem regarding to the cell edge problem because the users at the cell edge experience a low SNR because they. Um, here a very low power with respect to the base station that is serving them and a higher interference with, by the other base station that is close however close to them so one model to um, to think to the evolution of massive mimo uh, and to solve the cell edge problem and to give a, a ubiquity of communication a, lo a large coverage and a, a, a network that follows the user um, the concept of massive MIMO is a little bit changed uh, using the architecture of cell-free massive MIMO. So this is the last slide because uh, because you will uh, you will uh, speak about this with uh, uh, Professor Interdonato tomorrow. But the main idea is that 
uh, in SL3 massive MIMO, we substitute a multicellular system with uh, some base stations at the, cent the center of the cells. Um, and we substitute this with a system in which we cover the same area with a lot of access points. All these access points communicate by a central processing unit and cooperate in order to serve users. So um, we have large collocated antenna system are substituted by several access points with much less antennas. Access points are connected to central processing unit where data decoding happens and all communication takes place in the same frequency band as Massive MIMO. Uh, I put here to be continued because uh, these topics will be covered not by me, but by Professor Interdonato. But the main idea is that we are going over Massive MIMO, uh, of course, with RIS that you know and that you will study and you are studying and you, can, you will attend the, lecture, uh, the lectures next week in Siena uh, for this. But uh, um, there, there, is, there are other things beyond massive MIMO that needs to be studied, needs to be investigated in literature in order to further improve the performance of the communication system on which we are, um, we are working. So uh, this closes my presentation. Thank you for your patience, uh, for your attention. And uh, um, I, open, I am open to questions and comments. Uh, we have some time to, to discuss. Do you have some uh, comments, questions, or something that's not clear that you want to um, to discuss? I I was so clear. <laughs> Thank you, but I cannot uh, cannot behave in this. Okay, Robert. Hello, uh, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Uh, it was really interesting. I have um, a little question. Mm -hmm. Back to um, pilot contamination. Mm -hmm. You spoke about pilot contamination. You said we, it could not benefit from um, channel hardening and favorable propagation. So mm -hmm. I was wondering, like, um, why can it not benefit from this, uh, uh, from channel hardening and favorable propagation no the um uh, the fact is that science we estimate the channel and science we have the base station as the uh, observation only of the channel estimate uh, from the point of view of the base station we have not the um the fact that the user the the channels transmitted the the channels from the user that use the same pilot are no more orthogonal and no more um, are dependent because they have to uh, so they have the same the same channel simply with a different multiplicating factor uh, i will show you again the, the formula that maybe will be clearer mm -hmm. uh, because because the fact is that the channel hardening and favorable propagation uh, still is present on uh, uh, on the real channel but you cannot use this approach for the estimated one. So the, the channel, uh, the estimated channel are not, do not offer uh, channel hardening and favorable propagation because, oh, wait a moment, I will find the, the figure, okay. For example, here we say that, for channel hardening, I have that the channel over the channel mean needs to turn to one. Yes. Now, if I substitute the real channel with the G hat, I have that the G hat contains some contribution of the real channel plus some little part of pilot contamination. So my mean is a little bit changed. So the um, I cannot show by, uh, because of course these are these are properties that can be shown uh, uh, numerically, uh, but in, in the case of channel estimate, you cannot have that. If we have channel estimate here, you have not channel hardening in the channel estimate. But the real channel guarantee the channel hardening, but you cannot exploit 
this characteristic if you substitute the channel with the channel estimate. The same work for the uh, favorable propagation because the favorable propagation means that the channels needs to uh, are orthogonal some ways but this channel if this channel are dependent they cannot be orthogonal because they depend they depend one from each other so uh if we if you substitute this expression here that that can be shown only in the case of perfect channel knowledge in the case in which the channels are independent between them if you have um, if you have uh, um, that the channels are not dependent, so the channel estimate contain a contribution of the channel that you want to estimate, plus a little contribution of other channels, you lose this characteristic. You cannot show more this behavior. Okay, so if I understand, for, for us to have favorable um, propagation, the, the channels, the users, they must have independent channels, like one yeah. must not have a contribution of the other yeah okay and in the case of uh when we are transmitting the same pilot uh, what in in what practical case can we have a situation where we transmit the same pilot signals i mean two different users transmitting the same pilot signal yeah uh, if you uh, I, I go a little bit on the channel estimation Okay, in the, in the case of channel estimation, you have a set of orthogonal pilots, that is C1, C tau P. These are all the possible orthogonal pilots that you can design over pilots with length tau P. Now, if you take the, um, if you take the, um, the pilot assigned to the user are phi K, but phi K is one of these C. For example, phi K is, for example, C2. Of course, since k is larger when, than tau p, you have that different users can pick the same pilot in this set. And this is how, why and how two users can transmit the same pilot, but because they are assigned to the same sequence in this set. So because of that, they interfere because they transmit the same data. Since uh, the channels are different, but the, same, the data are the same, and here we are, estimating channel, projecting what we receive over the pilot, if we have the same pilot, we we will have a correlation here. So we, we will observe the, the sum of the two signals, but we are interested only in one signal. Oh, okay. Okay, I get it now. So uh... I, I guess this clarifies. Oh yes, yes, yes. Thank you so much. So, um, just for curiosity, um, is this problem the problem of uh, pilot and contamination? Is it a great problem? Is it a, like is it a, a problem in massive MIMO, or has it been solved to a certain extent? No, it has been solved. For example, for uh, um, in using uh, a smart pilot assumption uh, assignment, because if you have the two users that use the same pilot are considerably far, you have that the amount of this disturbance is reduced. So uh, the 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 fact that this is a limiting. Uh, um, so if you read the first the first paper of Marzetta, he says that uh, uh, this pilot contamination is a problem for massive MIMO because while interference can be reduced, increasing the number of antennas, you have that a part of interference is cancelled, but a part of interference, because you have a favorable propagation. Favorable propagation works better for a part of the interference, but you cannot cancel all the interference because you have pilot contamination. You have that the channels are correlated. Okay. So you, you with favorable propagation cannot cancel completely the interference. So uh, the uh, what Marzetta says is that the pilot contamination cannot be eliminated simply increasing the number of antennas. Of course, there are some papers in literature that try to solve this problem and try to uh, show the performance improving using the techniques. One example is the pilot assignment, or for example, you can use also correlation in the channels in order to reduce uh, the problem of channel correlation because the channel is already correlated. So 
um, you have that the pilot, the pilot contamination do not affect a lot of the performance of a correlated channel. Uh, or also there are some uh, complex techniques and algorithms that uh, process this uh, observation and process this, the, the observed channel in order to reduce, for example, with successive interference current selection, goes to cancel the quantity of pilot contamination. But of course, you need to, to do some additional uh, additional things. Uh, you don't need only a large number of antennas to uh, to solve the problem of pilot contamination. You need to do some additional things. And of course, we are working on this, and a lot of people uh, uh, worked on on this topic. And in uh, you can find a lot of papers on this topic. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? Uh, actually, actually, I had uh, uh, one question. So, uh, so, so, so basically, in the, uh, when we introduce uh, like a reconfigurable intelligence surface, we have this uh, cascaded path. Like, uh, for example, in the uplink, mm -hmm. uh, let's say we do like a TDD and uplink channel estimation, and we want to utilize reciprocity. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, we. For example, for a single user, we transmit, uh, like when we transmit into the uplink, we have uh, a simo channel between the user and the RIS, like a single antenna user, let's say. And then mm -hmm. you have a MIMO channel between the RIS and the base station, which is uh, relatively static. And uh, in a mobility scenario, the other uh, component of the channel will be aging, uh, mm -hmm. possibly. So uh, in order to estimate, uh, estimate the overall channel, uh, like, does, uh, do we really need to uh, send? Uh, do we ne really need to uh, explore all degrees of free, uh, freedom of the channel uh, within one coherence block, or can we just utilize our knowledge in uh, in aging? Uh, let's say. Um, yeah, I guess uh, I work at deficit observation. Let's say like a. Yeah. I worked a little bit on channel estimation on RIS, uh, and what you can see is that you don't, need, in my opinion, you not, don't need to know exactly all the channels. You need maybe only some channel directions, because of course you need to know how the channel ages. Because, but the part that the channel ages is the part from the RIS to users. The part, since you have no mobility between RIS and base station, this channel, I don't know, but you are assuming that this channel does not age, right? Uh, I'm assuming that, for example, the, uh, the channel, which, the MIMO channel, uh, the RIS and the base station, it is, it has a relatively large coherence time, and mm -hmm. uh, the user, uh, uh, the user to RIS channel, the uplink SIMO, it, uh, has uh, uh, possibly symbol to symbol fading because the uh, because in 60 we are talking about very uh, like significant mobility scenarios. Yeah, so, you are working in scenarios with uh, 500 kilometers per. Uh, uh, that's per for hour, 5G, maybe. and then with the NTNs we have 1,000 even 1,000 now. Okay, um, so you have a lot of mobility, yeah. so of course you have to assume that the channel changes mm -hmm. symbol yeah. by symbol. Yeah, but of course, uh, so in my opinion, you don't need, of course, to know all the uh, channel coefficient. Maybe you can find what are the best directions, for example, using some economy sites, SVD, or something like this, um, in order to estimate only the major contribution of the channel. Because, of course, you have not time to estimate everything. Mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's why. Uh, maybe you have some, um, given these uh, main directions of the channel and given the knowledge about how the channel ages, with, uh, I don't know, maybe autoregressive models or something Possibly. like this. Um, maybe you, you can uh, estimate a good channel. But the problem of channel estimation, when you have a highest, a strong mobility, is very, it's very complicated, of course. Mm -hmm. so, so in my opinion, only a, a right set of channel directions should be, should be enough. Mm -hmm. I see. So uh, for example, like by estimating like at like in a sense uh, sampling this ar process for example mm -hmm. uh, like uh, if we do this uh, sampling thing like per uh, sending pilots periodically and then sending data in between and then uh, performing like uh wiener interpolation from our channel estimate mm -hmm. and stuff uh, for example in that sense uh, do you think that uh, applying uh, some smart face shifts uh, to the uh, reconfigurable surface, like to the risk, uh, like, uh, 
Uh, does it have uh, any contribution to the error covariance matrix, like the risk but, matrix? Yeah, I think yes. Uh, in particular, the use of RIS, because uh, you can find in literature some paper that use RIS uh, for channel estimation, use RIS that is static. For example, uh, you have some uh, um, some uh, entries that reflect and some entries that completely do not work. Uh, but in my opinion, you have to to find what is the best RIS configuration in your particular situation, both mm -hmm. for downlink data transmission and also for channel estimation. For example, but in my case, uh, in our case, we have time to do this. Um, we consider different random configurations of the RIS in order to have more observation on the channel. Of course, here you have not this time to do this. So maybe you have to find what is the best configuration of the RIS that maybe can be, for example, uh, given that the user started from one point, uh, doing some, uh, um, I don't know, maybe a kind of uh, uh, sweep of the risk that can follow more or less the RIS using the uh, the user, sorry, <coughs> using the um, uh, the a kind of analog implementing by the RIS a kind of analog beam forming that point and try to follow the user. It can be an idea. I don't know if it, it's work, but uh, I think that you you should use the the RIS to uh, help the base station in the channel estimation because otherwise you have a kind of channel that is uh, that works where the base the RIS is not present. But when, when RIS is present, maybe the channel behaves differently. Mm -hmm. Because so this um, might be my idea. Yeah, because because like. Uh, in this error covariance matrix, when you use a passive risk, for example, uh, mm -hmm. when you use a passive risk on the uh, diagonal entries, the phase shifts kind of cancel out uh, somehow mm -hmm. uh, for the diagonal entries. So, I mean, uh, relate uh, I, and uh, as a consequence, uh, the metrics that are related to the uh, diagonal entry entries of uh, a, a channel error covariance, because like mm -hmm. we have this vector parameter. Uh, uh, when we have that, for for example. Uh, like it seems to me that uh, the active risk is the only way to uh, kind of tune uh, these entries and and uh, the passive risk kind of cancels out. Yeah, yeah. Maybe uh, in large majority of cases, the passive RIS lose a lot when you have a multiplicative fading. That is the, mm. the main problem because you have a multiplicative fading and uh, so you lose something when you have a RIS. If you have a passive RIS, uh, you cannot compensate this multiplicative fading. Mm -hmm. While with active one, you can, you can improve a little bit the performance because you are also considering some power amplification. Mm -hmm. So, of course, an active RIS maybe can uh, help you a lot. Uh, but then we need to also uh, incorporate uh, to our signal model the uh, the noise of the power amplifiers on the risk, right? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the uh, noise of the power amplifier of the RIS includes some amount of noise. And I see in literature also some uh, static noise additionally. But the amount of the static noise is less with respect to the uh, so the largest part is the dynamic noise that for that depends on the RIS configuration of course. Mm -hmm. So yes, maybe in the design you can uh, you can avoid the additional noise, but in the uh, but then in the performance you can see how much this additional noise. Um, gives you problems because I guess that with additional noise it's quite worst to define the RIS, in particular in a system where you have a, la a large mobility. So maybe for the channel estimation, you can assume an ideal passive RIS that do not include noise. And then in the performance, see how much this approximation is uh, uh, is degrading your performance. Mm -hmm. OK. Thanks. This can be an idea. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So other questions? No questions. Okay, so I hope that this lecture. Uh, one be... one more yeah. question, please. Sorry. Yeah. Um, at the end, when you were talking about the summary for a massive MIMO, you talked about the cell free um, architecture. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I have a little worry, or I don't know, it's a doubt. Like for massive MIMO, we have many antennas, we have few base stations, and with many antennas, and I assume that the power consumption is high. So, yes. 
if we divide this into a self-free architecture where we have many access points with um, fewer antennas, is this not approximately or equivalently the same? I mean, the, in terms of power consumption, is there any improvement or not? Well, uh, the amount of power consumption, the, so the, the, the model for the uh, power consumption depending strongly depending on the architecture. So the model that I discussed here is represented for massive MIMO, uh, collocated massive MIMO with a few base station and with a lot of antennas. If you have uh, um, a lot of base station with less antennas, uh, you have that the uh, power consumption, of course, per access point, the power consumption reduces because you have less antennas per access point. But of course, you have largest backhaul power consumption because you are transmitting on the backhaul or as you will discuss with Professor Interdonato, the cell-free evaluate a kind of uh, channel estimation, then takes this local channel estimation to find a local estimate of the symbol transmitted and then transmit this local estimation of the symbol transmitted over the uh link with the optic fiber because the final estimation is made at the central processing unit so of course you lose something in terms of power consumption regarding the number of antennas that you have at the access point but you are increasing the power consumption for the backhaul for so um maybe more or less the two approaches power consumption be... in comparison maybe has any uh trade or oh, sorry uh, comparison be ma been made between the two like the power consumption in the massive my most scenario and in the self-free scenario well uh, i guess that the amount of power consumption related because uh, as we said at the beginning the uh, graph that i have here the power con the max the largest part of the power consumption is because of the power amplifier Okay. So since you have a lot of antennas, you have a lot of power amplifier or, or one power amplifier with large efficiency. So if you have a lot of antennas, uh, you, have, you need some power for power amplification. If you have less antennas, you need less power for power amplification. So maybe uh, in cell-free massive MIMO, we uh, benefit from this and we consume less power per access point. Then the amount of power that we consume for the backhaul uh, can be comparable with the one that we consume for massive MIMO because also in massive MIMO we transmit data to the core network and to to the to the final destination. So more or less they can be comparable. So uh, I guess that I am not a comparison here and I, I have not a comparison in terms of numbers, uh, but in terms of uh, idea maybe the self-free machine memo can help us also from the point of view of power consumption, because in this case, I have less antennas per access point, so I consume less antennas. Of course, I have more access points, so I have to supply, to have a power supply to all these access points. So it's, uh, I guess that this trade-off, it's not easy to see the, this trade-off only by intuition. You need to, to, to compare with two very, um, uh, very specific models the case of self free and the case of a massive MIMO and see what are the numbers because from the intuition um, depends on what model you use if your model takes only into account the uh, number of antennas maybe self free massive MIMO is better with respect to massive MIMO because you have a lot of access point with few antennas but you have to uh, supply all these access point and you have that the eight percent of power if, if power supply then you need to backhaul the data over to add the CPU and the CPU needs to add additional processing to process data. So you have to take into account also the power consumption consumption in these two other, uh, in these two other parts. So my, uh, my idea is that if you consider all these things, maybe it's not so uh, straightforward to say what is the best, depending on the, uh, so, so we have to observe the number Be because by intuition, it's difficult to, to say what is the best. Okay, okay. Yeah, well, thank you. You are welcome. <laughs> okay, so uh, if there are no other questions, I thank you for your attendance and for your uh, interesting uh, questions. I hope that you will enjoy these two days of uh, uh, PhD school, but in particular, uh, I hope you will enjoy Siena uh, next week. Uh, and I wish you a good day and see you on presence maybe uh, sometimes.
बाय बाय